Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the IC Topic Chats. I'm Matt Feldman. I'm with uh, Goshen Education Consulting, and I'm kind of I am your happy um, host today. We have a we have a guest host in Kathleen Sullivan, um, and I'll, I'll get to her in just a second. But before I get too far with that, I, I just want to say welcome and welcome to all the people who follow us on YouTube. This it's great that you participate. Um, the these sessions are always on Thursdays at noon Eastern. I happen to be in mountain time, which is crazy. It's 10 o'clock here, so that's exciting. Um, that's the wonderful thing about these IC topic chats. We can do them uh, view, uh, via a Zoom call. Um, for those people who are in the session right now, go ahead and put your information in the chat. For those of you guys who are um, fo following us through YouTube, feel free to reach out to me. I think you know how to. Um, so that you, if you have any questions about any of this, particularly the link that Kathleen's sharing, we should be able to, we're going to include that in the email that goes out tomorrow or on Monday. Um, with that, Kathleen, I'm going to pass it over to you. Kathleen has been a, a, a participant with uh, the IC Topic Chats for as long as I can remember. Um, and she is going to present today on her RFP decision matrix. And I think it's a wonderful, um, a wonderful session that she's done for others. I've he only heard about it, so I'm excited to hear some more about it. With that, I'll pass it over to Kathleen. Thanks, Kathleen. Great. And everyone is going to get to see um, how little I know about doing slideshows. So um, this is why it's live radio, folks. Oops, that was wrong. Sorry. Let me try to find slideshow. Who can help me tell um, where I'm going to find slideshow press, on the top? Press of F5 screen. if you're on a on a Microsoft uh, computer. F5. Oh, oh my gosh! See, I came to the right place. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you everybody um, for uh, for being here. Um, I am Kathleen Sullivan. I'm principal of Fine Gauge Strategy, um, which is a uh, consulting firm outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And um, I'm going to be presenting on a document that's been in development for about uh, six months or so now, um, the um, RFP decision matrix. Uh, there's a link to this tool in the chat and um, not essential to read it, but it would help uh, your understanding of the presentation. Also, you can find it in on the resources page of uh, my website, and that's that uh, yellow um, link right there. So um, I'm going to set the stage really briefly. Oh, next slide. Um, four, uh, four parts to this presentation. The first one, um, brief introduction to the decision uh, matrix. I'm going to go over a few uh, of the key categories of the issues within the tool and a few specific factors that might need some additional description. Um, and then I hope that most of our time is going to be spent on discussion and Q&A. And as we go along, um, if you have uh, questions, please put them in the chat. So how did this come about? Um, the, the comparison between doing good, doing well, and, um, and what happened next. In late 2020, some of you have heard this story before, I landed a terrific evaluation project on a topic that I am really passionate about. And I worked on that evaluation with a colleague uh, pretty steadily throughout 2021, didn't do much marketing. Uh, and in early 2022, I submitted three bids in January and February. Uh, one of those was with a colleague, and I heard within the space of one day in March that I slash we were runner up on each of these bids, and this picture um, illustrates how I felt that day. Uh, you can probably relate to that feeling, or hopefully you can't because it's never happened to you. So uh, what happened next as 2022 wore on, I secured several good evaluation uh, assignments, but also through Ann Price, uh, my buddy who is, uh, who is here today, I got an excellent business coach named Tracy Snoyer, who is in Portland, Oregon. 
And I told Tracy this story and she said, um, how do you decide how to respond to an RFP? And this was my answer um, or sort of my answer, read the stars maybe. Um, I was thinking of putting a picture of entrails here because I think really the true uh, answer was I go by my gut. Um, so Tracy uh, recommended that I develop a better way of figuring this out. Um, and she uh, referred me to several general business decision checklists, um, which I took a look at and then started building um, a tool that I thought was going to work for my practice. And so the, the RFP uh, decision matrix that we are going to discuss builds on um, all of that uh, background. Um, and I have been really fortunate to have had a few folks review the matrix um, over the months and prices, uh, office hours, colleagues reviewed it with me. I had uh, three or four brief conversations with program officers at foundations because that is uh, generally my target market. Um, and so the version that you have uh, that you have access to, which is I think version seven or eight reflects those um, conversations and I'm continue to be interested in people's uh, you know ongoing um, thoughts about it, how we could uh, modify it to make it better. So we'll talk about that later on. So the uh, features of the tool, um, it's a discussion guide. Um, it has scoring, you'll see, um, and uh, down on line uh, 35, it has a scoring guide. I don't think that you have to score it. Um, for close call decisions, it might be um, helpful to, uh, to do that if you're working with a team um, and people are not uh, certain about um, a, a particular uh, RFP, it's very close, you might actually want to score it. Um, second feature of the tool, it's not universal. Um, I, a number of the factors that are reflected in the tool are really more relevant to situations where you're marketing to a client that has flexible processes. Um, I'm assuming that some government, that government agencies don't, that universities don't. I haven't marketed to those um, types of organizations. So uh, you will know better than I do, but if the organization that you're marketing to is heavily bureaucratic um, or the process is really inflexible, this may not um, apply as well. And I would, would be really interested in hearing what other um, limitations um, you think uh, are applicable to the tools. And we can definitely uh, discuss that later. So the uh, value of the decision matrix, talked about that a little bit already. As a discussion guide, I think the principal value is to um, make explicit all of those issues that go into the gut checks. Um, and by making those criteria explicit and by ensuring that nothing important gets left out, I think that you can make uh, decisions more confidently and particularly make them more confidently when, um, when uh, an issue of whether to respond to an RFP or not is a close call. Um, four categories of uh, questions or factors that you will see in the guide. And in this section of the presentation, I am not going to go through every factor in each category. Um, we can discuss any factors that you'd like to uh, during the Q&A. Right now, I am just going to touch on a few factors in each of these four categories that I thought might need um, some special explanation. So the first category I identified common values with um, the client, uh, that's line 13, if you're following along at home. Um, if you feel really strongly that all evaluations should be participatory and the client doesn't, or if you're far apart on your views on diversity, equity, inclusion, this might not be the client for you. Um, same thing if the client's team is very talented, but your personalities or your work patterns are just too dissimilar. And uh, that's line uh, 14. 
And, you know, my feeling there is that most evaluations are going to last uh, weeks or months, and that's really a long time to um, need to be working with people that you don't see eye to eye with. And, of course, in addition, if you're not seeing eye to eye with the client, um, it's likely that somebody can serve the client uh, better than you can. Um, quality of the RFP, uh, this is actually um, uh, uh, in the category of attractive uh, business opportunities. It's been a little bit controversial um, when I've been discussing the decision matrix um, with folks. I, I would, I submit that if the RFP has clear and feasible objectives that there's a better chance that uh, working with this team is going to be less challenging than if the RFP is unclear. Now, I would say to argue against myself that I have had um, several situations and uh, perhaps this has happened to you as well, where the RFP um, seemed clear, uh, everything seemed crystal clear, got the work, started in on the work and realized that the team that was, uh, that the implementation team, um, the, the folks whose work is the subject of the evaluation, uh, totally wasn't on board uh, with the evaluation. <laughs> Happened to me at least twice, uh, maybe more times than that. So, but I think the quality of the RFP um, and how clear it is, is something that we, um, that you might want to take into um, consideration. Um, availability of pre-bid discussion with uh, an economic um, buyer. Uh, I have found that pre-bid discussions really help to shed light on many of the other questions that are um, factors in the tool. For example, how many other teams are bidding, um, whether this client already has um, a team uh, in mind and they're doing an RFP for some other reason. I personally rarely respond to an RFP if there isn't some availability to have question and answer with the client. But I realize, uh, again, that uh, bigger or more bureaucratic um, uh, RFP processes may not offer that opportunity. Um, uh, in this third category, relationship with the client, here I'm only going to... Um, I'm going to hit only on this one aspect, which uh, it's line 29 um, on the tool. The client expects you to respond and maybe even to take the work. Um, if it's a long-term relationship that has been really fruitful, uh, you may decide to respond even if the work is, um, is not that attractive. And um, other of the factors within this uh, category, uh, relationship um, factors um, also uh, uh, feed, feed into that. Um, would be interested to know when we discuss whether um, people have um, responded to an RFP for that reason. Marketing opportunity, category four. Um, Another important reason to, um, to bid an RFP could be to get the client's eyeballs on your work. Um, many of my clients and prospective clients are not regularly on social media. Uh, they're not located in um, the, the city and state where I live. Um, so marketing to them is challenging. I do it in other ways. As long as you have enough skills and background that the client is looking for and enough time, you may want to respond to the RFP um, just to get a representative example of your thinking in front of the client. Um, more marketing opportunity considerations. When you're deciding on submitting uh, an RFP response, be thinking beyond this project. And this is uh, line 31, 32 of the tool. Uh, if you get this project, will it lead to more interesting or lucrative work uh, with this client or with another client, a client that they are associated with? Um, is this an opportunity to politefully and skillfully tell the client that their pro project is problematic and provide some alternate solutions? And that is, uh, that's the concept of doing a no bid letter, which um, is on line 47 of the tool. So um, 
your uh, results might vary as the advertisement says. Um, these have been uh, these have been the results that my firm has had with it. Uh, we've only used the matrix a few times, but um, in those times it's been helpful. And on the, the first uh, bullet point there, a colleague and I bid on a sole source project because of our interest in, um, in the community that was being served by the nonprofit uh, prospective client and the topic. Also, the organization's strategic planner slash coach uh, asked us to do to, uh, to put in a bid. Um, on that project, the executive director deferred action on the entire uh, on the entire MLE project, so uh, that one didn't go forward. Um, second, uh, the the second bullet point, we got a short turnaround RFP request, and the colleague that I was uh, planning on working on that with, and I decided not to bid uh, in part because of the um, of the schedule for turning around the RFP, and in part because we didn't have time to fill in a gap in our background by uh, recruiting an additional partner. And then um, third uh, situation up there, um, another colleague and I used the matrix to decide to not bid an RFP. We had, um, we had the skill set for that one, but we decided that, um, that the client could probably find the services that they were looking for in a more cost-effective way. So we decided, and we told the client this, that we were likely not going to bid. In that situation, we submitted a timely no-bid letter. We submitted a, a no-bid letter on the, de on the deadline for the RFP. And uh, that letter in part offered to provide um, supplemental expertise on the project that was uh, being bid. So that's, um, that's how, uh, my firm has thus far used the used this tool. So um, just to conclude, um, this is what this is. Uh, decision matrix is principally a discussion guide. The goal is more confident decision making. Um, these are the four principal categories of factors that I've uh, discovered, and you likely will have more or different factors. And I'm looking forward to hearing about them uh, next. And this is me and my grand dog. My grand dog and my, my grand dog uh, rocking um, his, um, his raincoat. Um, so uh, just in conclusion, would love your uh, comments and recommendations uh, for changes, um, edits. Uh, and my dog is actually, my grand dog's actually kind of relevant uh, to this presentation. Um, and it's because uh, Dexter helped me to write a LinkedIn post about, uh, about um, designing evaluation questions. I think that was last month. So um, if you folks uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, um, you'll get to see and get another picture of my, of my grand dog there. Well, thank you, Kathleen. I know we'll go into the discussion period here. Is there any, any um, so I guess I have a question before we, we stop the recording for you. Uh, and I, I think we talk about it, the competitor. I mean, I think I wouldn't even probably get, get to the point of looking at the RFP decision matrix if I just know, or I have, I feel in my bones, as I think you put it in my guts, that this is just, they're asking me for a bid because it's not even, they just need a, a loser because they know who they want to fund. But it's you did cover that. And it seems like I wouldn't even get to this point if it's like, okay, I, I can read on the page that this is meant for somebody else, one of my colleagues, one of my friends, somebody I'm competing with. Um, but that that seems like that was covered in the section um, competitor marketing opportunity. No, no, I'm sorry, the uh, the the uh, relationship yeah, with the client. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes even farther. I mean, there are um, there are tales of folks who have um, received RFPs, and they're pretty clear that they know which of their competitors helped the client to write the RFP. Right. Um, and so, I mean, we've I've had this situation. I've had I've actually been in a situation where some of my very good clients say, "I want to fund somebody else. We're going to fund somebody else, and I need." Can, can you submit a letter of interest that we're going to deny? And, you know, it's like one of those awkward situations um, that, that you have to kind of wrestle with because- I'm, Matt, have you, ever, have you ever done that just for my curiosity? Have I done it? 
I have. I mean, have you have you responded and said, yes, I'll do that for you? Yes, I have. It's an awkward situation. And it was like they were going to fund the other person. Um, and so I, it was I, it's, I, I can't change the system that I'm that I'm working within. So in many ways, it is what it is. Well, I think, you know, again, relationship building is um, is very big. I mean, depending on what market you're in, you know, how um, how intimate your marketplace is, I think relationship development is is huge. And um, we do favors for our clients that um, are not in our immediate um, economic interest, but we have to hope that, you know, down the line, um, the relationship is right. Yeah, we have to assume, I mean, we, we operate from, a lot of us operate from, from the assumption that our organizations and the systems that we work in are fair and they make sense and, they're, and they are supportive for our clients. And then in this situation, this was funds that came from an external source and they had to work through their system and they knew who they wanted to fund. The external people want, knew who they wanted to fund, but it had to work through their system. And the system was this university that had a, had a like an onerous process. And so everything, every, the, 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 all the telltale signs were, we need to fund this one individual and that's how it's going to, oh no. Oh, sorry, my screen went dead. I thought maybe I lost you. Uh, anyway, all the telltale signs were one where they were going to fund those folks and uh, one way or another. And so I, I, I helped su uh, support that process to effectively do a work around their system. So it is what it is. One other thing, actually, um, while we're uh, maybe while we're still on tape that I would say, and I would be interested to hear if other people have done this. Um, when if I have had an ongoing conversation with a client and um, they are going to issue an RFP. And I uh, get to the point where I am pretty certain that I am not going to uh, be a, a good competitor for the RFP. Several times I have offered to do the RFP process, to develop the RFP and run the RFP process for the client. Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm in that conversation with the client because I clearly have some expertise that they value. Um, and, um, and it may, you know, there may be a, um, a modest, well, there is always, you know, a modest, at least a modest fee associated with running the, um, the RFP process. I have found that doing that increases my understanding of the market. It certainly increases my understanding of what the, how the, what the competitors offer and how they put themselves forward. And um, my clients, which do not have a, you know, th those of my clients that don't have a substantial back office to do this, um, and have our, you know, are grateful that somebody with some experience in working RFPs um, will help them out this way. So that's something I've done two or three times. A couple of other thoughts um, before we stop the recording. One is when we, when we did the survey of all the independent consultants about um, eight years ago, the one of the top ways to gain new marketing opportunities top ways to gain new work is through responding to RFPs. And one of the worst ways to gain new op opportunities is to respond to RFPs. And it was just an interesting thing. So there's dichotomy. And what we realized when we read through comments and, and thought about it was if you're if you're responding to kind of blindly without, you know, the without the thought that you put through in this decision matrix, um, if you're responding blindly, you're going to find yourself doing a lot of work that goes kind of probably to waste because you don't have an understanding for what who you're responding to and all and having the having gone through what's in in your matrix um and so you will find yourself probably spinning your wheels in ways i mean it might help through help you to get around your in your head who you are who you're trying to serve you're going to learn through some hard knocks in that situation um it's also a fantastic way and the way i i work um, responding to RFPs is not usually as the prime, I'm as the sub to a, P, a principal investigator who's responding to like the Department of Defense, the 
National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Education, and other sources. And I, I respond to RFPs through providing an evaluation section for a proposal. And I think that's been very successful. It's usually low impact because after a while, you kind of learn how to write these things and it becomes... Um, now, I, I probably need to spend some more time, and I think this is a bigger conversation on whether those are the best projects for where my firm is heading, but that's another conversation for another time. The other thought, the other thought I had was sometimes people come to me and say, I want to give you this project. Or, uh, you know, I, I want you to be our evaluator on this project, just completely out of the blue. And I think there probably needs to be a companion decision matrix for, do I take the job? Because they're not always the right jobs for us. But it, but when somebody comes standing there, basically like, we're ready to give you money and work. It's hard to say no, because it's so exciting. And you're like, wow, I'm so popular. But then you realize this was a really bad, op, you know, this was a bad opportunity. Maybe we shouldn't have done that. And so we find ourselves in those situations a lot, or not, <laughs> maybe, maybe not a lot, but <laughs> we, we found ourselves in those situations. Any other Agreed. thoughts on that, Kathleen? You know, um, again, I think um, it, I, I think really the relationship and the ongoing relationship, and this, this, is, this is where relationship issues start to get a little bit cloudy, right? Because um, sometimes the person uh, or the the firm, the organization that is coming to you and and um, you know wants you to do a, a project, is a client, a former client. Sometimes it's a friend of a former client, um, and um, so you know how far outside of the ring of your likely clients are you are you willing to go in order to do to do somebody a favor? You know, I think that that is. Um, I think that's part of it. I think a lot of the things that go into the decision matrix um, could so in a way be adapted to it. So if somebody's coming to you and saying, we want you to do this, can you do us a favor? If you have done a similar project a bunch of times in the past, you have, you know, my all of my work is qualitative. So, you know, I have um, two, three interview guides that I could uh, put together relatively easily, it seems like a, a, a project that is similar to a project that I have uh, done before, so I can kind of see the architecture in my brain, then maybe it's maybe it's worth doing um, in order to preserve the relationship. If it's something that is going to require me to bring on additional people to um, uh, to have um, resources or skills that I don't have easily in front of me, then I think that that's another another consideration. And I think it does not, it doesn't hurt to be um, suggesting to your marketplace what the business realities are. I think um, often, uh, and I'm just, you know, speaking for folks who I talk to who are mostly marketing the way that I'm marketing, which is to medium and larger size nonprofits and to philanthropic foundations. We um, we don't pull the curtain back and show them the business as much as we should. I think that um, we uh, often tend to be too accommodating. So like when a client says, well, in addition to these X number of interviews that you're going to do, um, we really want you to, uh, to do a survey. And their view of survey, I mean, you know, what is their view of, of survey? I think at that point, um, you, uh, we all do need to be saying, well, um, you know, this is my expectation of what a survey is and does and costs so that um, the next time, whether you do it or not for this client, the next time the client goes to another consultant or um, another vendor and says, we just need a little survey. <laughs> um, you've, you know, you've done your part to educate the marketplace about, about what the work actually costs you. People who've never been in business do not understand that. I agree. And I think one of the big one of the big things when you're talking about pulling back the curtain is just an understanding for our costs. Um, and that's actually, I think, what we're talking about. Is it next week or two weeks uh, soon? I think that's next week is about our our setting fees and all the things that go into our costs, because 
um, particularly with with folks who have firms who have overhead, the costs kind of start to add up. Um, when you're a one person operation, they're a little bit less. You don't have as much overhead, but these are things that need to be taken into account when you when you set your fees. And they say, hey, can you do this for five thousand dollars? And you're like, no, I can't do anything for five thousand dollars. I mean, I can't anymore. Not really. It's because it's it becomes complicated just with the communication and everything with that. Um, a couple of comments that came in through the chat that um, I want to point out. It's, um, one individual talked about how they like to go to the pre-conference um, sessions just to, to meet others. And it turns out that that can be a good way to create opportunities to, to meet others and, and go to bid together. Um, I also want to suggest if you're not interested in responding to an RFP, um, I think Kathleen, you talked about writing the RFP, but another thing to do is consider um, whether you can you can review proposals and if and oftentimes there's a little bit of money involved with that but frankly the money isn't near as uh, as important and valuable as understanding how people write proposals and what you and what you find are the winning proposals and it teaches you how to be to write winning proposals in the future so that's a wonderful strategy for you if you're if you're trying to get your feet wet and understanding how to respond to these things find the people Excellent. you want to work with and and perhaps not respond, but ask if you can help review, um, identify your, um, if you have any conflicts of interest, hypothetically you don't, and then perhaps that creates a relationship with you and the client. You never know where that goes, um, but if you create a great relationship, you know, that becomes the kind of thing that perhaps you can be their evaluator in the future. You could also be recommended for other kind of work down the road, so. Okay, I'm gonna yeah, stop I, recording. I, oh, go ahead, Kathleen, I'm so I was sorry. gonna say, I agree, with, I agree with that, Matt, and I think, you know, um, if if um, you are in the sort of general arena that I am marketing into nonprofits and, and foundations, you have almost inevitably come across the sort of allied um, consultants, people who um, are doing coaching or strategic planning, that kind of thing. There is a lot of there's a lot of coaching involved in doing uh, measurement and learning work. Uh, all of us have coached um, clients. We've coached prospective clients. Um, and so I think that's a very, that's a really, really good um, thought, Matt, and really a line of business that um, many of us should be thinking harder about is, you know, if in fact, this particular assignment um, is not an assignment that is that makes sense for us or that we even want, is there a coaching aspect to it? Um, you know, and as you were suggesting, Matt, part of that could be um, reviewing the proposals and working with a client to understand why one is stronger than the other. Yeah, I completely yeah, agree. Yeah, it's always worth um, reaching out. Um, you know, there's lots of kind of creative ways that we can connect with uh, projects um, and with potential clients. And thinking outside of the box oftentimes are the ways that create opportunities, uh, not related to RFPs, but related to just marketing and, and, and business development. Whenever I get invited to a client like conference, usually there's other evaluators there and we're all usually bored because nothing's about evaluation. So I always go out of my way to reach out and say, hey, can I present on evaluation? And they're almost always like, oh my God, I'm so glad you asked. And then what happens is I stand up in front of a bunch of my my fellow evaluators, and that's great. We get a chance to talk about what's important about whatever we're doing. But I'm also half the half the audience is usually potential clients, people who are looking for evaluators or have evaluators or need direction with evaluation. And invariably I create relationships that can create the opportunities down the road. So that's just one way I've thought out of the box and it's created opportunities for me. But that's un unrelated to RFPs. Very smart. Anyway, so thank you very much, Kathleen, um, with fine gauge, fine gauge strategy. Um, and I want to make sure everybody goes out to see her. If you if you're using her um, matrix, please reach it. Let her know how you're using it and how it's wonderful. And if, I'm sure that if you have suggestions for the next iteration, she'd be happy to uh, learn more about how how it's been valuable or could could use some. Uh, some additions, but uh, I think it's been great. And I think it's been another way for us just to think critically about who we work with, why we work with these folks and, and whether it's the best use of our time. And we're, we're not going, don't everybody leave who's still here. I'm just stopping the recording. <laughs> so we can go to comments now. Bye everybody in YouTube land.